Thank you all for your um, long hours. Um, I've seen it, not always directly, but I know how much work has gone into this. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And let's keep growing this Greater Grand Rapids Reads idea, and uh, we know that we will make the difference. So let's get on to the uh, last major portion of today. And this is uh, our final speaker. And uh, he is final because uh, he is special. And uh, this is uh, Tony Campbell, who's going to come up here. He is Vice President of Community Investment for Heart of West Michigan United Way. And previous to his work with United Way, Tony served as president and founder of the Institute for Educational Partnerships, a national nonprofit uh, dedicated to researching best practices in community and school partnerships. Tony has been a frequent speaker at the National Conference of Big Brothers and Big Sisters and at the National Educational Leadership Conference. So please, our very own, right here from Grand Rapids, Tony Campbell. Well, I'm going to be brief. And um, uh, I know that one of the per persons that they had, had invited to come do this closing speech was the, the governor. And I was really hoping that the governor would come <laughs> because then I knew we would have everybody still here all the way to the end. But uh, uh, also I was hoping that the governor would come because at, uh, a couple of years ago uh, I was doing, I was scheduled to speak in Virginia at a big community rally. It was, uh, we had about 3,000 uh, 3, people at the rally. And uh, the uh, governor of Virginia was supposed to speak, and then uh, the uh, senior senator from Virginia was speaking, and then Colin Powell was speaking, and then my job was to come up after Colin Powell and to tell the group how they were going to uh, actually do the work that Colin Powell had inspired them to do. So the governor got up and spoke, Powell got up and spoke, and then uh, 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 General Powell had to, to leave. And so when Powell left, the governor left, and then the senator left, and then all the TV cameras left, and then about 2,999 people left. And so I was left speaking to about one person in the audience. And so I was really hoping the governor would come today <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Uh, also, I'm, a, 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 I'm an, an introvert, and um, so one of the things I do to kind of handle my nervousness about public speaking is that I take my glasses off and I can't see. So I don't know what you're thinking out there or what you're looking at so, or what you're doing. So I'm just going to plow on through this. And normally, I would say that I, uh, I don't wear my collar normally. The um, uh, uh, only time I wear my collar is really on Sunday mornings when I'm uh, uh, preaching at uh, Messiah Church. Uh, but today, I decided to wear my collar because I wanted to emphasize not only with my words, but I also wanted to emphasize with my dress and with who I am how much I believe in what we are trying to do in this community right now. I believe at this point in our history in Grand Rapids, maybe even at this point in our history in a country, as a country, there is no task that is more important than the task that we've been talking about and that we're engaged in today. I believe that Grand Rapids will be no stronger than Grand Rapids Public Schools. I believe that the economic health and vitality of our community will only be as strong as the literacy levels of the people who populate our community. And I believe not only for those reasons, but I also believe because when I look back at my life, my grandfather, when he moved from South Carolina and moved up to Richmond, Virginia, I remember my grandfather telling me a story about when he came to Richmond. They told him that if he was going to be able to keep his job in the railroad, that he was going to have to learn how to read. My grandfather talked about coming, working all day, coming back at night, and at night working with my grandmother. And my grandmother, who had worked during the day, they both worked during the day, and she would teach him how to read, letter by letter, word by word, until he learned how to read well enough to keep his job. But I remember one of the most powerful things that he told my grandmother that he was most proud of his, uh, what happened to him in life with her was that because of her efforts teaching him how to read, that he not only could just hear the Bible, but for the first time in his life he could read the Bible. And I believe because of my father and my mother, my father and my mother left the farms in rural South Carolina, went to the first persons in their family to go to college, 
and they raised their standing of living to a middle class standard of living. But even more importantly than that, what they did for the hopes and dreams and the expectations of their children is that my brother and my sister and I all expected to go to college because they raised that literacy level, raised that expectation level. And I believe, I believe because we know how to teach people how to read. We know how to teach people how to add and subtract. We know how to about teach people how to balance a checkbook. We know how to teach people how to read a prescription. I know and I believe because we know how to do these things. There are many things in our society that we don't know quite what the answer is and how we're going to find the answer or how we can provide the answer. But to these things, we know how to do these things. And I believe because I have seen what can happen to people when they don't know how to read. I remember in the very first uh, organization that our a little nonprofit in South Carolina, I remember we brought in 180 kids and these kids had been sexually abused, physically abused, every kind of thing that you can think of happening in their life. And they would stay with us at our church for, uh, for the entire summer. And they would stay there and we would do uh, academic remediation and a lot of work with them. And I remember every morning we would start off and I remember talking to this one young man about uh, talking to the whole group about the presence of hope in our lives and how we had to always maintain hope. And I remember walking out of the sanctuary and we were going over to the cafeteria and this young man grabbed me by the sleeve and he said, Rev, I want you to tell me where the presence of hope is in my life. He said, Rev, before my mama, she died, everything was all right with us. But when my mama died, Rev, my father was an alcoholic and he couldn't take care of us. And so my brothers and sisters are all over the state of South Carolina. And Rev, the place that I was staying in, the foster home, I can't go back there because those people can't take me anymore. And I don't even know where I'm going when I leave this place. And all I own is what I have on my back. And Rev, I am 16 years old, and I can't even read. So you tell me where the presence of hope is in my life. There was a gap in that young man's life, a gap of hope, and a gap of what he expected to achieve in life. And as we look in our own community, if we look at the, uh, the growth in our community, the growth in non-English speaking people has grown by 194% since the last census. And if you begin to, um, uh, again, uh, extrapolate that down, 33% of the people who speak Spanish in our community say that they don't speak English or read English well enough. 28% of the Asian and, uh, Asian and Pacific Islanders say that they don't speak English, uh, read English well enough. That is a gap in the promise that we give to our people, a gap in hope and a gap in the ability to, to achieve. Also in a national survey, 80% of the manufacturers uh, in America say that they don't have a literate enough population to be able to run their business. And 21% of the people of the adults in Grand, in Grand Rapids and 14% of the adults in Kent County say they lack adequate reading skills. That is a gap in their ability to achieve and a gap in their expectations in life. And only 14% of our children entering into kindergarten in Grand Rapids public, into Grand Rapids public School are prepared to learn. That's a gap in their ability to achieve. We must be able to close that gap, and we can only do it as we work together as a community, as we come together as a community to make this work work. In the human service field, we have often funded things that we hope will work. The great advantage that we have in literacy is that through research, we know what will work, and if we can focus our efforts and focus our time and focus our dollars, we can make a significant difference. The only question is, will we have the will and will we have the commitment to see it through to the end? I think that's our task and our challenge as we look at the days ahead, to bring the will and the energy, the commitment on this day, to not just talk about things that we could do and should do and make great plans, but there are young people out there, there are elderly people out there, there are adults who are out there expecting us to continue and to bring it through and to bring it through to completion. And sometimes when we look at days like today, and we begin to think of the immense level of the task that is ahead of us. And we begin to think, oh my gosh, we've got these great plans and these great dreams, but then what are we going to do? Where are we going to find the funding? Where are we going to find the effort? Where are we going to find the will? Will this just be another coalition that we start in this city, that we do a great plan and it sits on a shelf somewhere? I would say to you that the issues are so critical that we cannot allow that to happen. 
The issues are so critical that we must find the will to push this through to completion. And I would also say to you that as the American people, when we decide to do something, when it becomes a matter of urgency, that we find the capacity and the way to do it. I remember as a little boy, I used to hate going to the South. I grew up in Gary, Indiana. We didn't have segregated bathrooms. We didn't have segregated water fountains. But I remember on my first trip to South Carolina, my father stopped in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I remember getting out, and he was getting at a gas station, and he was getting gas pumped. And I walked over to the water fountain, and I bent over the water fountain. A little kid couldn't have been much more than seven or eight years old. And I began to drink water, and the gas station attendant came up behind me and grabbed me by the back of the neck. And he checked me up, and he said, hey, nigga, you go drink in the back. And he pushed me. And I went around to the back of that gas station. And as I went to the back of that gas station, all I found was an old nasty water hose and just grease and filth and tires and dirt. And I remember walking back around to the front of that gas station and I looked at my father. And back that, during that time, during the South, if you were a black male in the South, there's only so much you could do to protect your family. And to this day, I can still remember my father's pain. To this day, I can still look and see the hurt that was in my father's eyes, that there was nothing that he could do at that moment to protect his family. And I began to walk away from that water fountain, and I thought, my God, what kind of place is this? My God, what kind of people is this? My God, this place will never change. But a woman named Rosa Parks decided one day not to give up her seat. A young minister in the South named Martin Luther King Jr. got drugged into leaving a, leading a movement. And then what happened across the South was that black people and white people marched together. Black people and white people suffered together. Black people and white people dreamed together. Black people and white people died together, and they changed the South. And because they changed the South, they changed this entire nation. And as a people, if we can come together to change the South and change the way that we live today in this community, then we can still come together and we can educate our population. We can teach our kids. We can reach people before the early, early childhood, before children come into kindergarten. We can make a difference with adults. We can do these things if we choose to, if we bring our commitment and our will and our willingness to work all the way through to the end. If we can change the South, certainly we can teach Grand Rapids how to read. We can do this. It's within our capacity. It's within our ability to do it. I remember a little girl in Gary, Indiana, reported uh, was doing well in school. And then around October, this time of year, she began to fail in school. And her guidance counselor came and talked to her and finally got the little girl to confess. And the little girl said, well, my daddy told not to tell. And the guidance counselor immediately thought that something sexual was going on in the household. But what she discovered was that the father lost his job. The father lost his job because as the, as the steel mill was beginning to upsize, you needed a certain capacity, ability to read, to be able to take on the new jobs. The father didn't have that capacity. The father lost his job. It's because he lost his job, there was no money to pay the heat and utility bills. And so this girl was coming back home to the dark and to the cold in northwest Indiana. And so they got together and they began to teach the father and to work with the father to increase his literacy skills. They made a deal with churches to help pay for his utility bills. And because a community came together and cared about this man and his family, the girl had a future because she began to achieve again in school. And that family had a future because the father could read well enough to support and protect his family. That is the kind of work that we've got to do in our community. Those are the issues that are before us. It is not just the ability to read and to write, but it's the ability to be able to care for those that you love and care for this entire community. Last thing I'll tell you is that uh, I, uh, when I was in college, I uh, ran the high hurdles. And I love running the high hurdles, because the high hurdles are only about 110 meters long. And when you run a high hurdle race, if you finish the race and you are not even sweating, 
you still look good. You know, I mean, you know, you got to sweat, none of that stuff. And so, you know, and I went to school out east, and so the Washington Post would cover our track meets. And so, you know, I'd finish a race, and, you know, and they'd win a race, and then the reporter would come up to you, and he's taking a picture and all that stuff. He said, oh, Tony, that was a pretty good race. And I said, yes, it was. He said, you look pretty good. Yes, I do. You know? <laughs> But I can also run a quarter mile. And a quarter mile is the most difficult. It is the toughest race in track and field. Because a human being can only run about 180 yards before your body runs out of energy. And when you run out of energy in a quarter mile, and you still got to run, you know, about another 120 yards or 180 yards more all the way to the end of the race, you begin to eat up your own body. And so when you're running a quarter mile, you're just exhausted. And you finish the race and you got. Your hair is all messed up. That's back when I had hair. You know, you got sweat coming all down your face, and you got slobber coming all out your mouth. And you know, like this, and your body aches, and somebody comes and they pat you in the back, and they say, "Great race," and you say, "Oh God!" <laughs> Just come shoot me! I don't know. It's awful. We were running. Went to the Naval Academy. We were running our arch rival West Point. We'd already beat West Point in the track meet. And so I just knew that Coach Gerties wasn't going to make me run the quarter mile. But Gerties wanted to really rub it in on West Point, kind of like, you know, Michigan would like to rub it in on Michigan State or, or vice versa, depending on who you're cheering for these days. But anyway, so we, he told me I was going to have to run the mile relay. And I was upset. I was mad. And so it came time to run the mile relay, and, and our first leg got the stick. And I guess because he knew we'd already won, he just kind of walked around the track. And so by the time he handed off to the second guy, the guy from West Point had an 18-yard lead. And so then the second guy gets the stick, and he does the same thing, and he kind of goes to sleep. And by the time he hands off the stick to me, and on third leg, West Point's got a 25-yard lead. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this? You know, I'm just upset, mad, didn't want to run the race anyway, don't have to run the race. So I just get the stick, and I just start going, and I just run, and I bring it down from about 25 yards to about 20 yards when I hand off the stick to Daryl Anderson. Hand off the stick to Daryl Anderson. I walk into the middle of the track, put my sweat clothes around my head. I can't wait to tell Coach Gertie's off as soon as this race is over. I'm sitting down in the middle of the track just kind of fuming in self-righteousness. And then all of a sudden I begin to hear everybody begin to yell and to roar and to cheer. And I get up and I run to the edge of the track and Daryl Anderson is running as fast as he can. And everybody's cheering. I'm going, but God, he's going to die. You know, you can't run that far, that fast, and not die. And so the people are cheering. And I'm going, but he's got to die. And when is he going to die? And he's going to die somewhere. And so they're roaring and cheering. And all of a sudden, Daryl comes around the last curve. He gets around the last curve and he brings it even with the guy from West Point. And they're running neck and neck until they get about five meters from the tape. And they both begin to just strain and push. And they get about a meter from the tape and Daryl Anderson leans over and he nips the kid from West Point and we win that race. <laughs> and what I discovered in that race was that I didn't have to worry about the quarter mile. Because all I had to do was keep the stick close. If I would keep it close, Daryl Anderson would bring it home. Let me tell you about kids in Grand Rapids Public Schools. I've never met a child or a teacher who went into the beginning of the school year and said, how can I fail? If we can keep the stick close for them as a community, all of our kids will succeed. I've never met a mother or a father who start out in life trying to figure out, how can I fail my kids? If we can keep the stick close, all the parents in this community will be able to protect their kids. I have never seen anybody going to work in a new job saying, you know, I want to figure out how I can fail and how I can get paid the less amount that I can. But if we can keep the stick close, all workers in this community will succeed. And not only that, the economic environment in this community will be better. This is our time. This is our challenge. This is our opportunity to make this community a better community, to make this community a more equitable community to make this a community in which everyone has the opportunity and the ability to be able to read, to dream, and to achieve. Thank you very much.